uh, interpret a speech, a famous speech by a person who really admired Mahatma Gandhi, a person who was a spokesman as well as the president for the civil rights movement in America. And the famous speech he gave, the title was, I have a dream. Can I have any guesses who is the speaker? Martin Luther King Jr. Luther King Jr. He was a very effective speaker. For this speech, to listen to this speech, there were more than 20,000 people who had gathered and they all applauded at the same time. So you can go back in time, 60 to 70 years at the least, and try to imagine the thunderous round of applause that he had received. Today what I am going to do is to interpret this speech. Now, as, uh, as the evaluator mentioned, we have to identify what is so special about this speech. There are a few things that a good speech has. One is you need to have, you need to have uh, emphasis on phrases by repeating at the beginning of sentences, which creates a drama, which creates an effect, a long-lasting effect that all the listeners will take away with them. You need to repeat the key theme words throughout your speech so that the entire speech has that theme and it, it, it feels like it has been woven specifically for that topic only. You should have metaphors to highlight the contrasting concepts. Metaphors are truly one of the most effective ways to communicate. If you pick up any of the historic books that we have, be it Mahabharata, be it Gita or any of others, they are filled with amazing metaphors. So that is something that uh, speech should have as well. So let's start with the speech. Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration of freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation, the momentous decree that came as a great beacon of light and a beacon of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of, materi of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still and languished in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. And so we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of constitution of the Declaration of Independence, in a way, they signed a promissory check to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise, a promise to which, uh, a promise that all men, that's right, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed unalliable rights of life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as the citizens of the color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the great bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity. We refuse to believe that this check which will give us the, the, the demand of riches and freedom will be coming in with insufficient funds. We have also come to this hallowed spot today to remind America of the fierce urgency of this matter. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. 
Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of this movement. This sweltering summer of Negroes' legitimate discontinent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. But there is something that I must say to my people to stand on the warm threshold which, lays to, which leads to the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to justify our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with a soul force. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are devotees of, uh, of, or devotees of civil rights and they keep asking, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels on the highways and the hotels in the cities. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a little bit larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by the signs stating for whites only. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes that he has nothing to vote for. We, can, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have, have come from fresh, narrow jail cells. And some of you have come from the areas where your quest, quest for freedom, left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearthed suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia and go back to South Louisiana. Go back to the slums and the ghettos of northern cities knowing that somehow this situation can still be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you my friends. And so even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in an American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. What's the creed? We hold these truths to be self-evident and that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of the slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, <coughs> sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children be, will, be one, will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of inter uh, interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as brothers and sisters. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every
every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, and the rough corners will be made plain. The crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and flesh shall see it together. Free at last, free at last, I have a dream today. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Over to you.